the following is a segment from the Carl King Podcast. If you enjoy this show, be sure to like, subscribe, and send us burritos. First up, we have The Ward from 2010, and this is possibly the final film John Carpenter will ever make, but you never know. It's been 12 years now, but he also took a 10-year hiatus before making The Ward. Will he make another film shortly? We do not know for sure, but I hope he does. The Ward was screenwrited by Michael Rasmussen and Sean Rasmussen. If you're curious, they recently wrote a movie about some people stuck in a crawl space under a house. Huh. Okay, then. The Ward stars Amber Heard, a female actress from Austin, Texas. I noticed everyone is talking about her lately, so she's probably pretty good. It also stars Jared Harris, and I never knew that guy's name, but I've seen him in so many things. Looks like he was in Fringe and Mad Men, but he was definitely in something else I've watched, and I just cannot figure out what it was. Even scrolling through his entire filmography, I have no clue. Now, isn't that something how you can see an actor in so many movies or TV shows and never know their name? Anyway, I hit play, and the movie starts off with approximately 300 production company logos which usually means you're in for a low-budget movie. The teaser is visually driven, and it communicates exactly the information that the viewer needs. You know, we've got some creepy medical tools, and lots of what I think is lightning, but that lightning doesn't look real to me. There's way too much of it, and it looks literally like light switches turning on and off. The lightning strikes don't fade out at the end, and you'll notice throughout the movie, it has a lot of lightning storms. But it did take place in the lightning capital of the world, Oregon. I read that this story is set in the 60s, that's the 1960s, but I'm not sure that even mattered, because it never even occurred to me while watching it, so it could have been any time before the internet. So we get into the main part of the movie, and Amber Heard burns down a house. Okay, then. I'll let everyone know. I notice they skip the entire legal process between arresting her and admitting her to a mental hospital. And at this point, we have no idea what's up. Are we just supposed to think she's crazy? And is this just a stock generalization? Or are we going to get more detail than that? I think too often we use these blanket terms like insane and crazy and mentally ill it's kind of like the modern-day version of a communist or a witch. So the nurse hands her pills and says, Here, take these. And she says, What are they? And the nurse says, Something to help you get better. Oh, come on now. I can't remember who said it, but screenwriters tend to write characters based on how people behave in movies rather than writing characters as people because they've seen so many movies. It's like, this is what characters in movies say. Can't remember who, but someone said that whatever your first instinct is for dialogue in a particular scene, don't do it. Because thousands of other people have already used those lines in similar scenes. And this exchange was an example of that. By the way, listeners, have you ever visited a psychiatric hospital? Well, I have. And it definitely wasn't stocked full of well-dressed young female patients who look like cheerleaders. Now, what are the odds of that? It reminds me a bit of Sucker Punch, although I remember that movie being a lot more creative in some ways. Anyway, Amber Heard then sits down with Jared Harris, who is her doctor, and he says, let's discuss what happened yesterday. What? In 24 hours from her arrest for burning down a house, she was already admitted to a fancy mental hospital? Well, that's fast. Doctor doesn't even know why she's there. That's a bunch of poop. And I keep wondering, does Amber Heard have fake hair? Is, is that called hair extensions? Because why does her hair look kind of fake? It's too poofy somehow. 
Throughout the movie, a number of implausible things happen. For instance, the doctor leaves a letter opener, basically a knife, right there on his desk in front of her. So he looks the other way and she swipes it and later uses it to pop open the lock on her cell door. She just turns it like a key. Click. Ta-da. But this is what people do in movies, I guess. Everything is easy. In another scene, an orderly comes in and says, I've got some clothes for you. Now, how the heck does he know about clothes for her? Because I've been married for 12 years, and I wouldn't know the first thing about getting clothes for my wife. I would not dare. The other confusing thing, the girls in this ward with Amber Heard seem to have barely any issues. For instance, one of them is kind of annoying, and another tries to feed food to a stuffed animal, and that's basically it. But they're all perfectly made up somehow, like they have access to a professional hair and makeup artist in there. Again, if you've ever visited one of those places, they don't have professional hair and makeup artists in there. Another implausible scene, the nurse leaves her office wide open and goes on break with all of the medication cabinets also wide open. And then we get a shower scene, and in this psychiatric hospital, they make all the girls shower together in one big room. For the purposes of the plot, I guess. So the doctor suddenly decides Amber Heard is just too crazy or mentally ill, and they decide it's time for electroshock therapy. They put her on a table, and the doctor puts a rolled-up bandage in her mouth, And she acts like she can't spit it out. She's like mumbling and yelling through it. And get this, when they zap her, they're holding her down on the table with their hands. And someone cranks the knob up to 2,000 milliamps. Now, is that a lot? I don't know. If you know, let me know. Anyway, I don't think they should have been touching her when they zapped her. But I could be wrong about how electricity works. Later on, the doctor sets up a metronome to hypnotize one of the patients, and he sets it at like 120 BPM, and he says, listen to the rhythm. It will help you relax. No, I don't think so, because 120 is like a fast walking tempo. It makes me nervous even hearing that clickety-clack. All right, well, pretty much all of the dialogue in this movie is literal statements and questions about facts. Everything they say is on the surface. Amber Heard spends most of her time asking the doctor questions which he never answers. So for a movie about psychology or psychiatry, we get very little character depth. And man, that psychiatric hospital has very poor security procedures. For instance, there's a massive air conditioning duct in one of the girls' bathroom stalls. It's maybe three and a half feet wide? Now, who the heck would design and install an air conditioning duct that big right behind a toilet? Well, I sure would, because I like to keep cool and have plenty of air circulation when I'm pooping. And here's another thing. Amber Heard borrows a penny from one of the girls in an earlier scene, and it turns out she needed the penny to unscrew the mesh and get into that vent. So the girls crawl around through it, And there's one of those stock moments where they're in the ceiling of a room and someone walks under it and hears a noise and looks up through the vent. And all we needed at that point to complete the cliche would be knives stabbing through it. But they didn't bother with that. When the girls get to the other end of the ventilation shaft, the mesh on the other end just happens to not be fastened. And it easily pops out. Because if it was fastened, like the one on the other side, they wouldn't be able to unscrew it with the penny from the inside. They'd have to go all the way back, and the scene would be a waste of time. Anyone out there ever been to an Ikea and tried to find your way out of one of those? Well, this psychiatric hospital was designed like an Ikea. Because how big can this building really be? They're running up and down stairs, up and down elevators, Running, running, running. My favorite thing in a movie is just people running. Is it possible to make a horror movie without people running? Anyway, the movie ends in kind of a nonsensical way. Because it's revealed that the whole thing was a delusion. 
Okay then. In my totally subjective opinion, this movie was a stinker. But we need to be very careful because it's too easy to mistake subjective for objective. Because someone out there would probably say this is their favorite movie of all time. And by the way, I'd love to meet and interview that person, whoever you are. So here's my diagnosis. This movie had two serious problems. Too many of the scenes were implausible, and the dialogue was superficial. And I can't understand why people write movies like this, but here are two possibilities. One, audiences actually enjoy them. And two, maybe this was the best script available at the time. Maybe it was like, we're making a movie, what have we got? Okay, well the crew's already here and we don't have anything better, so let's just shoot it. But here's what confuses me. I can't understand how John Carpenter made something like this. It makes me wonder, how did he go from making such an entertaining film like Big Trouble in Little China to this? Or wait, were all of his movies actually like this? Is The Ward kind of like his saint anger, after which he finally got tired of making movies? Now, actually, in my opinion, the concept behind this movie seems promising. What if a girl is in a mental hospital with a bunch of other girls, and in the end we find out all the other girls are her multiple personalities, including her? She is one of the multiple personalities of someone else. And the ghost that's killing each one of them is the original personality trying to rid herself of the others. Okay, that is interesting. It's kind of a fight club thing. So the script and the execution are the problem here. So here's the filmmaking lesson that I take away from it. You can have a fantastic concept, but it can go totally wrong in the execution. I'm giving this one two out of five stars on Letterboxd, even though it makes me feel like a total jerk. If you enjoyed this segment from the Carl King Podcast, remember, you can also listen on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or through an old rubber hose.